Hi students, welcome to class. Today we're going to talk about institutions. Um, our discussion questions for today. It's always a good um, idea to have your discussion questions um, already written so that as we go through the um, lecture you can write the answers. So the first thing I want to talk about is kind of a back to intro, right? What is a social norm? Um, and this comes from the basic concepts of intro to sociology. Um, a norm is an everyday rule for behavior. So think um, polite behavior, think respectful behavior, think common courtesy, right? So you wait for people to get out of the elevator before you get in. Um, you you shake someone's hand when they extend their hand to shake and with you. When you get in an elevator, you turn and face the door. Those are norms in our everyday um, everyday life, right? So if you break a norm, it'd be like the example of uh, cutting in line would be breaking a norm, right? Or stepping on someone's toes is breaking a norm. I mean, it comes from the idea of norms, values, and mores. So a norm is an everyday rule for behavior. A value is a more tightly held rule for behavior. Um, so think, be honest, be, don't steal, don't, um, don't be violent, those kinds of things. Those are values in our society. So some values are um, contracted by law while others are not. So don't think of these as three separate categories. Think of it as like a rainbow where they bleed into each other. A more is a value that is so uh, strictly held in our society and so important, it's essentially a taboo. So things like, um, um, rape or murder or pedophilia are considered mores in our society. So a norm is just an everyday rule for behavior. Uh, so today we want to cover gendered institutions, but you need to kind of understand what an institution and a social structure is and some of the differences between the two and how they're actually fairly common, um, fairly kind of um, commonly associated. Um, so an institution or a social institution, two names for the same thing, um, is any persistent pattern or social interaction, and it's aimed at meeting the needs of individual people within any given society. Um, so usually, especially in our Western culture, an institution allows us to um, meet the needs for individuals where it would be difficult for individuals to meet those needs for themselves. So think of education. If you go into a school and you have a system for education for all children, it's going to create uniformity and it's going to be easier for parents to go to work and um, contribute to the economy um, and have and then teach their kids other aspects of their life instead of just focusing on things like reading and writing. Um, so the more complex interdependent positions, right, those create, um, tend to create a system for us in society and they reproduce themselves over time. So think how like um, an institution like a bureaucracy is going to continue to read, um, reproduce itself even after maybe its main goal is not um, no longer needed. March of Dimes is a good example of this. This is a nonprofit organization that was started um, to help people and to raise money for people who were getting po who had polio, which used to be a huge crisis in America. Um, but after polio was no longer a huge crisis in America, um, March of Dimes still continued to exist because it's a bureaucracy, right? It's an institution, so it creates its own inertia and continues on, right? So the way that you should think about an institution is you should think about it as something that sets the context for your everyday life. When you go into school, you know how to act, or when you go home, you know the context that um, you're in and you know the expectations of your behaviors. Um, when you go into a court system, you know the different expectations within those systems, those institutions, right? Um, so it shapes our behaviors. It even shapes the way that we think about things, depending on the institution that's most closely regulating us at the time. 
a social structure is an entire set of institutions. Um, so frame your thinking on more of a macro level. So another basic sociology term, macro level, think forest as opposed to one tree. A tree is micro, the forest is macro, right? So you're thinking large scale group, macro level social structures within society. So an entire set of institutions is an entire, is a social structure. And social structures also, um, they also perform essentially the same role, right? Um, they set the standards and expectations for our life. Um, they establish the norms and the values and the mores in our society. Um, they play a crucial role in reproducing um, our expectations and themselves, right? So think in terms of like the entire religious system as opposed to your church or synagogue or the education system as opposed to your school or the economy as opposed to um, your job. Uh, another example would be um, the judicial system as opposed to a court. So a court is the institution, the judicial system is the social structure. A few examples um, of, these are most of them, politics, education, economy, these are the big ones. Medicine, like medicine is a good institution, social structure to think of, right? So um, we have Eastern medicine and Western medicine, and those are two different social structures. They have two different contexts for the way that you engage with them. They have different expectations. They, um, while they provide a similar function within the society, they go about it in different ways. And so it's a different context, a different set of norms, a different set of values, a different even set of mores, right? Um, so you can see kind of there how culture can change institutions, um, religion, law, science, um, military, mass media, and family. This is the one that catches people off guard. It's not your family, micro level. It's the institution of family, meaning the context for which we establish policies and norms and um, and even laws surrounding who's allowed to be family, who's included and excluded, who gains benefits, right? Um, why do we have a fight for same-sex marriages? Um, because there's a lot of benefits and policies that can either um, improve somebody's life or really harm them or limit their access to resources based on whether or not they're considered family. Um, so it sets the context for your life. It shapes your life. It influences it. Um, it even changes the way or influences the way people think. Okay, so enough with like the basics of um, review of <laughs> intro to SOCH. Um, how do institutions um, organize our everyday lives? Um, and institutions and social structures together, um, by the way, you're going to hear these two terms interchangeably. Um, oftentimes, even sociologists, we don't really differentiate. Um, we will say social structures or we'll say institutions, meaning the macro level social structural impact, right? Um, and that's because they're, they're actually fairly overlapping, so there's not a huge difference. Um, they both play a huge crucial role in their lives. They both um, establish persistent patterns of social interaction. They both establish norms, right? Um, but they might differ in their nature and intensity of enforcement, meaning different institutions specifically um, might differ in their nature and intensity of how they enforce particular norms. Um, so different families might do that. Um, different schools might um, differ in their intensity, or even within one school, you might see a differentiation in intensity. Um, but all of those institutions still are going to shape the overall social structure of the society. So even though they're on more of a micro level, they still have a pretty large impact on the overall social structure of society. How do you change macro level social structure? You change the institutions. 
And that's actually quite hard because of um, institutional inertia. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then they are generally instrumental in meeting the needs of individuals within a society. Um, so think about like how frustrated a lot of parents were during the pandemic because they had to homeschool their kids or because they were partially homeschooling their kids because the kids had to go to school online, right? And so parents were upset and angry. They were saying, you know, we also um, realized that children lost several years of education. A lot of children are really behind in reading and math because of the pandemic, because the individual families were really struggling at being able to maintain um, the level of education that was being met um, when children were going into a building in, and they were being um, educated through trained professionals within the institution of school, right? Um, so they really help to shape those um, individual needs. Um, think about if we didn't have something like policing and um, and prison systems, you know, for as many problems as we have, could you imagine having to police your neighbors, having to imprison your neighbors, having to be the court systems for your friends and family and neighbors if they were to commit crimes? Those are things that are taken out of our hands and put within government or governmental power and control because it's not something that we can readily do or easily do as individuals. Let's talk a little bit about um, some of the most gendered institutions, right? So if you think about family as an institution, um, one of the things about family is because it's an organizing principle um, that allows us to um, navigate our lives, it also allows us to teach like norms and values and mores to our children to help socialize other people within society, right? And family is an extremely gendered institution in, in the idea that we have very concrete, almost, gender roles for men, women, and children um, within the family. Um, and even though you might see kind of like um, an ebb and flow or kind of a give and take in, of the gendered expectations, um, within some an institution like family, you're still going to see gender as a persistent feature um, in an institution like family. You see it in almost all institutions. Gender becomes a persistent feature in almost all institutions, but it's really highlighted in terms of the family. So if you think about it, like if you walk into someone's house and it's a hot mess, you're not gonna go, oh my gosh, this dad doesn't take care of his house, right? You're gonna say, oh my God, this mom um, doesn't clean her house. Why? Because we have very um, deeply rooted ideas about gendered expectations, especially when it comes to who's supposed to take care of the children, who's supposed to clean the house, who's supposed to run the errands, who's supposed to do all the domestic labor, all of those things, right? And we like to establish that and maintain that through our institutions. And so family is probably very good at highlighting kind of how we gender things like that. Also, in the fact that we are in still an extremely heteronormative state or heteronormative culture, um, you see the gender binary is absolutely reflected in a lot of institutions, um, but especially within family, because think, um, think of how we have an idea of family as a nuclear family, a mom and a dad and kids, or it's always heteronormative. It's always um, a male and a female, a mom and a dad, right? So we use things like institutions to reflect binaries, um, to help um, continue with um, the gendered features um, and to help kind of organize principles around gender um, or around something else. But in this case, family is a really good example of how that occurs in terms of gender. So a gendered institutions. Um, so think about it this way. If institutions are an organizing principle, 
then a gendered institution is an organizing institution along the lines of genders, right? So th in this regard, men and women or males and females are channeled into different activities, different spaces, different choices, and those spaces and choices are valued really differently um, and have very different consequences based on what you choose. Um, so if you think about something like education, education is an extremely gendered institution. Um, I've heard uh, and seen written that the playground is the most gendered place in America, right? Um, and that's because it's a persistent feature of education. Um, even if it's an uneven feature, it's still a feature, right? So playgrounds are extremely gendered. Boys um, take up about 80% to 90% of the space of playgrounds. That persists over a lifetime where men um, as a whole take up more space, physical space, than women. Um, so it starts early. Girls tend to play on the blacktop. They play around the monkey bars or um, those types of activities and boys take up the additional space, right? So all of the grassy area. Um, so when they've done you know, sociological studies, they found and mapped out that boys were taking up the majority of the space and the girls would concentrate in on a really smaller space. And this comes or stems from gender norms that come from early on, so family and then into friends and then into the education system and then into later um, parts of our lives. We start to see that kind of grow and disperse, right? Um, so it allows us to reinforce those differences um, and reinforce um, inequality if, as a culture, we deem that to be necessary. Um, so how is gender reinforced through elementary schools? Through all of those ways in which I tell you, right? Even while it is in some ways um, a gendered salient type of institution, meaning that the relevance of gender kind of ebbs and flows or rises and falls across those spaces, um, it's still persistent within the institution. So it's the most predominant on a playground. Um, you don't tend to see it as often within the classroom um, in like maybe the way children are seated. They're probably seated not necessarily as boys and girls. We don't see that very often, but then we still um, gender separate our bathrooms. Um, by the time that kids get a little bit older, they've heard so much passive socialization about different um, different interests of academics that girls tend to think that they're not good at math and therefore they're not interested in math and boys tend to think that they're better at math and engineering um, and that they are more likely to be successful um, and it has very real consequences because those jobs are more valued um, both in terms of prestige but of course as well in terms of pay Um, so one of my favorite things is a room of her own. So why is sanitation a gendered institution, right? Um, and I like the kind of the story behind this. I also visited Europe and I found that sanitation is not a gendered institution. So in the 1800s, men and women, um, when they were first brought together in factories, um, that social integration really threatened um, the Victorian belief that women were much more fragile than men um, and therefore the idea was that they were less suited for working for pay. Um, and here's a, a lovely quote from the U.S. Department of Labor in 1913. A woman's body is unable to withstand the strains of fatigue and deprivation as well as a man's, right? So the idea was that women needed to have a rest room or emergency room so that they could go and lay down and take a rest because general labor, normal labor was so difficult for them that they might get dizzy or get sick or faint. Um, there was the idea that it could cause headaches and that they could essentially just pass out from doing any exertion, right? Um, so that was the solution, a restroom. Um, so that's why if you ever go to Europe and you ask them for a restroom, they'll look at you like you have two heads because there is no such thing as a restroom. It's a toilet, right? You ask for the toilet.
you know, the thing you're actually looking for, um, which is really interesting. Um, and we can actually see the remnants of this. Sometimes when you go into like uh, Macy's or into a nice um, department store, you'll see um, for women prior to the bathroom, um, there'll be a little additional room with a couch in there. Um, it's the restroom. And now we say it's used for nursing or something like that. Also to protect um, male um, ideas, uh, male privilege is the idea that um, men shouldn't have to see women um, doing things like that, like um, breastfeeding or fixing their clothes or anything like that, right? Um, I like the other one too, that was the other quote that said, um, this, so the solution, right, was the bathrooms. And the quote was, um, women are likely to have sudden attacks of Disney, dizziness, fainting, or other symptoms of illness, which is um, quite interesting, right? So that was um, the reason for restrooms is to be able to um, provide women with this room so that they could um, take a rest if they were too fragile to go on because of normal working conditions. Um, so why do we call sanitation or a bathroom a gendered institution? Um, it's It was essentially to protect, protect male privilege and reassert women's fragility. This made it easier for men to accept women in the workplace because it um, reasserted the androcentric belief, uh, Victorian belief, essentially, or ideology, um, that women were much more fragile than men. So it helped. They were allowed to come and work in a factory as long as they were still more fragile. Um, so what about today? Um, so interestingly enough, um, bathrooms today kind of do a similar um, thing. Um, today, about 90% of us, um, of our world's population, right, of us, um, benefit from a public sewer system, right? This allows us or ensures that we have access to bathroom facilities, right? We can go to a bathroom almost anywhere in the United States, government buildings, schools, workplaces, all those types of places. Um, and it allows women to do um, what Wade called body work, right? You can, it's not appropriate to do your hair, do your makeup or fix your clothes or adjust or um, even talk about things like uh, menstrual periods or tampons or pads, right? Um, so we have separate bathrooms so that we can protect male privilege and male privilege in this case would be uh, to protect men from having to see that women have real bodily functions, things like um, going to the bathroom and having a period. Um, and it allows um, that to be protected and invisible. Um, and it also allows us to maintain the idea of heteronormativity, right? So the idea that um, we should protect our private parts from being seen from the opposite sex, but not from the same sex, because somebody of the same sex isn't going to be as interested in our private parts as somebody who is the opposite sex, right? So the idea essentially that everybody's heterosexual and has the same sexual interests, and so that we need to protect ourselves from the opposite sex in that regard, but not from the same sex. Um, so it also protects or reinforces heteronormativity. It also protects the and reinforces the idea of the gender binary um, because we know that if people are gender fluid or ambiguous appearing um, or they're transitioning or they're non-binary, gender binary bathrooms just don't work for them, right? And it causes a many more challenges and stresses and, and problems um, for people in that regard. Um, and having gender neutral bathrooms would essentially be more inclusive and would solve a lot of those issues. Um, in addition to, which was not really brought up, but it's in addition to um, the idea of the gender norm that it's women who take care of children um, and not men. And so 
having gender gendered bathrooms with um, no facilities for diaper changing um, or you know act you know really um, appropriate toilets for little kids within the men's restroom but having them within the women's restrooms um, brings upon the idea or furthers the idea that it's really only women or women's work um, to take care of children um, especially children's I guess bodily functions so then um, we move in away from the idea of bathrooms or the concept of bathrooms and we start talking about sports um, and so when we talk about sports in this um, chapter um, the title is institutionalization of gender inequality so why are we separating men and women in regards to sports what's the reason and so the first um, example that was brought up um, is one that um, I kind of hold close to my heart because when I was a little girl, so my grandma, she was like 98 or 99 when she died. I'm in, I'm almost 50. I'm 48. I just turned 48 as of the making of this video. And um, when I was a little girl, um, she saw me riding a bike and she's like, little girls don't ride bikes. It's inappropriate for a little girl to ride bikes. So she still had some of those Victorian beliefs, right? So I just chuckle when I... Um, by the way, it was just the most egregious little, what we called a tomboy back then. Um, and so I probably stressed her out a little bit uh, with my behavior, my actions, and my way of dress. Because um, I, I looked like and I acted like um, the typical little boy of the 1980s and 90s. Um, 1980s, because I was a teenager by the 90s. Uh, but in the 1890s, right, so my grandma would have remembered this. In the 1890s, she wouldn't have remembered, but she would have known of this. She, would have, she was brought up still with that ideology. Um, bicycles essentially were introduced, and um, women started to ride bikes. And this was absolutely huge. It gave women mobility and freedom. They could get on a bike, and they could ride their bike miles away from the house. And this was the first time they really were able to um, have freedom of movement, especially independent freedom of movement. And it was absolutely phenomenally changing for women. Um, it also required that they use lighter garments and garments that wouldn't get caught in the pedals um, and garments that weren't so restrictive to their movements. And so it meant that women's styles changed and women started to wear um, garments that were lighter and allowed more freedom of movement and allowed, um, you know, allowed them to have a little bit more mobility in their everyday lives. Um, a great quote was from Susan B. Anthony. Um, if you don't know who that is, Susan B. Anthony is a person who really fought for women's right to vote. She's like one of the big wigs in that regard. And she said, I think it has done more to emancipate women than any other, anything else in the world. She thought bikes were amazingly um, great at uh, emancipating women, giving women freedom. Um, she had that great idea and that great notion about bikes, but a lot of people did not like it at all. Um, doctor, so society as a whole was like, this is horrendous, it's terrible, women shouldn't be riding bikes, women shouldn't be wearing shorter dresses, women definitely shouldn't have been wearing pants, all of these things, right? Um, even doctors warned against it claiming women's body, and claimed that women's bodies um, were unfit for bicycling, that it would cause things like migraines and um, dizziness and cause women to faint, that they were too fragile to ride bicycles, that it was inappropriate, that it was, um, some people said it was overly sexual or that it would sexualize women, make women too sexual. Um, it was really, really interesting, the resistance. By the way, um, the some of the same arguments were used against women moving into going to college as well. Um, doctors also warned that it was too much for women to go to college, 
that they wouldn't be able to um, handle the workload. They would, um, they're not intellectually or physically equipped to go into the and um, go to college. Um, that it would, they would get headaches and they would become ill and they would, you know, and they would lose their fertility. They wouldn't be able to have babies, right? So a lot of the same arguments by doctors, um, basically. By the way, all men. Um, because at this time, doctors, the medicine was an all-male institution um, and um, still is quite a gendered institution because um, all like uh, research really is done on men and males bod male bodies. And so a lot of the literature and information that we have about medicine is by men for men. Um, so that's why a lot of um, women are dismissed in terms of women's pain or women's issues. Um, that's why women are more likely to die from a heart attack after going into the hospital um, with, with heart attack pain than men. Um, because it's just dismissed. It's not recognized um, because we might show symptoms that are slightly different. But um, back to the college thing. Um, when they did finally let women into college, um, they were allowed to go in. But the women had to do all the domestic work for their male co counterparts, meaning you're allowed to come to college with the men, but if you're going to be here, you need to do all the, their, all the your classmates' laundries, laundry, you need to cook for them, you need to clean their dorms, right? Can you imagine today if the girls had to do the cooking and cleaning and laundry for the boys? And these aren't people that are in their family, right? These are just... Uh, classmates, right? They had to do all of that. So um, although they were concerned about, you know, the, you know, college being too, too difficult for women, they did allow women, um, you know, slowly to go into college as long as they were um, doing the domestic work of their classmates as well. I guess to make it easier for the girls, huh? Um, one of the things... <clears throat> that we don't think about is why we have a separation of sports, right? Why are sports gender separated by gender? And we often make the assumption that um, sports are um, naturally separated or separated for natural reasons because boys in America, we assume um, boys are um, just physically stronger. We still have that assumption, just like that Victorian ideology, um, that women are less than, women are less physically capable. Um, and sports are, from the inception, a very strong, basic um, part of a young man's life. Um, it's essentially the manhood in training. Think back to the... Um, the chapter that we read about people with disabilities um, and how they would use murder ball as a way to assert their masculinity. And that's because of that connection between sports and masculinity. And um, there's a really strong co connection there, right? And so it offers the opportunity for boys to assert their masculinity and for men to show how they're growing into being a man or how they are um, physically capable. Um, this means that it has been for a long time difficult for women to enter into sports. Um, sometimes even it's difficult for um, children to get their parents to let them do sports if they want to do a particular sport or um, for boys also being forced into sports to um, quote unquote make them a man or make them stronger or make them tougher. Um, so why are we segregating um, the two? Um, well, in essence, sex segregation in sports allows us to maintain the ideology that women are fundamentally less than men. Um, because the inclusion in, of sports, um, the knowledge of sports, it's a form of social capital. It's a way of gaining prestige and power and access to resources or connection to people, right? Um, and so it's fundamentally a male space. 
Um, and so what we've done is even though we've let women um, play sports, we still make sure that um, sports teams are separated so that we can maintain the idea that um, it's separate um, and that we're still unequal, right? So Americans especially, um, we still are very fervently supporting that men are naturally better athletes, they're stronger, they're more capable than women, right? Think back to the bathrooms um, in the Victorian era. It's the same type of argument, right? And even when women play sports, we inherently value and recognize the sports that men play as more valuable of needing more strength, of needing more skill, right? But when women play the same sport or a different sport, what we end up doing is we devalue the strength needed, we devalue the skills, those things are de-emphasized, right? We devalue the sports as a whole. Um, think about like the difference between football and what's called powder puff football. If you don't know what that is, that's um, flag football. Some boys play it, most of the time they don't, it's girls football, right? So football versus powder puff football. And I think this is a good example too, because not only is it different rules, right? We have to establish that there's going to be different rules because one is um, got a diva. I, I like how the name even really kind of shows how um, we consider it to be not as um, not as worthy in terms of strength and violence and, and all of these masculine things that we identify as important in our society, right? So it's football and powder puff football. Um, in gymnastics, there's male and female gymnastics, right? Hockey versus figure skating, right? We even kind of act like figure skating is not a sport. My son played hockey and we would get there right as the um, figure skaters were leaving. By the way, um, most expensive sport to for your kids to play. Don't ever let your kids play hockey or figure skating is insanely expensive. Um, we could barely afford it. But um, so you have to pay for ice time and you have to get up super early. So the figure skaters need to get up to practice when the ice is perfect. Um, so they're, the hockey players aren't allowed to go on until the figure skaters are done because of the necessity of figure skating. Um, so the girls would um, be there at 3 a.m. and they'd be done by 6 a.m. And then the boys would get there, the boys, right? The hockey players would get there around 6.30 or 7 a.m. Um, when, when um, and they would have hockey, hockey practice from like 7 to 9 or whatever. And then, you know, both could have like open skate or whatever. Um, or think about, so we value hockey as this like, strong sport it's fairly aggressive for our culture but even when you have hockey for girls it's hockey with different rules so you're not allowed to check your opponent um you know so even though we might still consider it a sport it's a lesser than sport right it's a less skilled sport it's a less masculine sport um or it's not a sport at all like figure skating by the way you have to be insanely strong to be a figure skater um, or just think about the way we think about basketball, right? There's the NBA and then there's the WNBA. And we just don't value one of those leagues the way that we value the other. We see it in the pay. We see it in the prestige. We see it in the way that they're honored. So why? Why do we do that? Well, in our culture, sex segregation in sports um, is about maintaining a different and unequal groups and we need to do that so that we can maintain our ideology in the belief that women and men are a fundamentally different that men are fundamentally stronger superior um, better skilled women are fundamentally less than the fundamentally weaker right um, and we create these even like whole institutionalized set of policies and rules to ensure that women and men never actually compete against one, one another. So they have two different leagues or two different, um, and with two different sets of rules. So you're not even competing on the same level in any way, shape or form. I had a student in this class many years ago and he was a returning student. He'd been in the military. He was an athlete. 
And he found this chapter really interesting because um, he was actually, um, he did the physical training for um, people in the military. And so he had to do physical training for both men and women. And he said, it's not that men are inherently stronger than women or that women are inherently stronger than men. It's that they have two completely different set of strengths. Um, he, and he pointed out, and a lot of times you see this, is that men ha tend to have more upper body strength and women have more lower body strength. Their legs are much stronger than men's and their, um, essentially their core muscles, like your stomach, was much stronger. So where men would outdo the number of push-ups women in the military could do, the women were by far outdoing the number of sit-ups, right? Um, but what the military and what a lot of sports do is that they will almost completely eliminate the activities, the physical activities or the sports and completely devalue the sports and the act physical activities that women um, have the upper hand in, right? Um, so it's more important to have upper body strength than it is to have core body strength. Um, it's more valuable or it's, you know, we see, we see in our society when we see strong, right? When we idealize strong, we idealize upper body strength. We don't idealize core strength, right? Um, if you've ever played with, uh, your friends wrestling or whatever, don't ever get locked in between the legs of any girl because her legs, her thighs are super strong, right? And it's really hard to get out of it, right? Um, so you see that it's not necessarily inherently one or the other. It's just that the strengths are not um, apple for apple. Why? Why is this so important that we don't recognize this? Well, how are we going to protect the belief in our gender binary, especially a hierarchical gender binary, right? Um, how are we going to protect the idea that men are superior to women if we allow men and women to play against each other at the same level, right? So it's actually men that lose if men and women play on an equal playing field in sports especially because if men win he's won against an inferior opponent and so it's not recognized as a real win but if he loses he's not just lost um against an opponent he's lost the presumption of superiority and that attacks the core, one of the core ideologies in our society about gender inequality and why we should maintain it. So it's really interesting when you think about it from that perspective. Okay, so why not change stuff? Um, well, mostly because institutions suck at changing. They, they're slow, um, what, what she calls institutional inertia and change, right? Even when we want institutions to change, even when um, people desire change, like I think a lot of people now really enjoy the gender neutral bathrooms um, and want the gender neutral bathrooms. I heard a story about um, this place. They decided to make their um, male and female bathrooms both gender neutral. And what I thought was hilarious was the story they were talking about was um, without any conversation, without anybody saying it, they basically made it a um, a number one and a number two bathroom. So if you needed to poop, you went into one bathroom. And if you needed to pee, you went into the other bathroom. So everybody was like sharing the bathrooms, but they had made it like a number one bathroom and a number two bathroom. I thought that was really funny. Um, and so they did divide it into a binary, just not in the way that we think a bathroom should be, right? Um but institutions, they're just slow. They're hard to change, right? Um, the example used was the, um, the gender neutral bathroom renovation for the University of New York. Um, and so they had tried to create a gender neutral bathroom for their building um, and they were unsuccessful. And part of the reasons why they were unsuccessful was because one, the building code required that all 
new large bathrooms install gender segregated facilities. So it's within the code. So it's set up in the policy, the law, the code. And if you know anything about code, and by the way, that's what my husband does. He's an inspector. And so he forces people to follow code. Um, so we can, so he's quite hated by a lot of people. Um, he thinks it's funny. It doesn't bother him because um, he's a, a rule follower, right? So he likes to say, no, well, it says this. I'm not telling you how to do it. You just need to follow the rules, right? Um, but so it, in it, the code said that you had to have gender segregated bathrooms. They did petition for an exemption. It was denied, of course, because it's a bureaucracy, right? Um, not only that, um, so that, you know, they, they hit a wall with the institution there. Um, I don't know why it would have been denied either, because that seems like something, at least today, it seems like they should be able to get a, um, an exemption for. Um, but also it was, it was, it came up or ended up being really inconvenient and really much more expensive to have a gender neutral bathroom. And that's because of designers and contractors and engineers, they all knew how to do a gendered divided bathroom, right? But they didn't know how to do a gender neutral bathroom. And so because of that, it made it confusing, difficult, time consuming, and really expensive. Um, and so unfortunately, even though it was what the people within that um, college wanted, they ended up with a gendered divided bathroom. <laughs> Anyways, so institutions, super, super difficult to change. Okay, so these are the terms that you should have learned. Um, institutions, norms, policies, social structures. A policy is a, an institutionalized rule, right, that is set into, uh, you could say code, but it's set, it's in writing. A policy is an institutionalized um, uh, rule that they put into writing. Um, social structure, what's the difference between a social structure and social institution? Keep in mind, they're very similar. So there's only a small difference between the two because there's a lot of overlap there. Gendered institutions um, versus just an institution, gendered salience and gendered binary. Um, and then that's the writing workshop again. If you didn't know though, if you were in this class in person, you would do the lecture on one day and then you would have to discuss again the writing um, what you guys do in writing, you would have to discuss those questions. We cover them again on the second day. Um, so you don't really do any more or less in an asynchronous class. In my classes, they're all pretty much set up the same. It's just that they're able to like talk through the answers as opposed to having them write it all down. Um, and then these are the different options for workshops. These are in-class workshops. And just kind of to show you too, like, so we do, like, you know how you have an activity and you have a, your writing workshop um, and you have a quiz. So my students in class, they still take the quiz online and they do their writing workshop in class and then they do this in class as well. Or sometimes they do one online if we don't have enough time and one in the classroom. Um, so just to kind of show you the expectations are fairly similar all the way through. <sighs> if you made it this long, 48 minutes, sorry. I try to keep it short, you know I do, but 50 minutes for a full lecture, you have to agree that that's not even a full class period because what are we, an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 30 minutes, depending on the school, right? Anyways, have a great day, and I hope you enjoyed the lecture.